Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Nizar Al Sayyad. I'm a professor of architecture, planning, and urban design uh, at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, I have been invited by Sabah and Mushara Properties to uh, moderate this session, and it is indeed my pleasure to be here. Much of my work has, in fact, dealt with issues of architecture and globalization over the course of the last uh, two decades. Uh, the session is entitled Bringing Identity Back, the Impact of Globalization and uh, Regionalism uh, on the Art of Placemaking. Even by its own title, I think it's extremely revealing, uh, bringing identity back. So the question is, uh, was identity lost and how has it been lost? The connection between the identity of a people and the forms and cultures of their cities have always been uh, the subject uh, of interest and research for many uh, people in many disciplines. Uh, we definitely live today in a globally compressed world that is constituted of national societies that are becoming increasingly aware of their ethnic, racial, and regional identities. And in fact, under this scenario, uh, globalization becomes difficult to comprehend without recognizing the historical and cultural specificity of the different places in which it operates. Uh, you will hear today from four speakers, uh, academics and practitioners, uh, whose approach to this particular issue uh, may be quite different. Each panelist will speak uh, in the same order in your program for 10 to 12 minutes, um, after which uh, we will in fact encourage questions from the audience uh, and I will engage the panelists uh, in uh, some discussion. Let me just introduce the panelists very briefly and I'm just going to introduce them uh, in one time. Uh, so that they don't have to do that after each uh, speaker. The first speaker is Will Alsop, who is one of the United Kingdom's most distinguished architects and a recipient of the Sterling Prize. Uh, often described as the bad boy of British architecture, uh, he now leads uh, Alsop at RMGM, um, and, he has, um, <laughs> and he has actually held many academic positions, uh, but he is currently a professor at the Technical University of Vienna as well. Uh, our second speaker is uh, uh, Beatrice Galili, uh, who is the chief curator of Lisbon Architecture Trianelli and the founder and director of Gopher Hall, an exhibition space in London. She writes regularly for architecture magazines and occasionally lectures at the St. Martin's College of Art and Design. Our third speaker is uh, Professor Mike Jenks, who is a professor emeritus uh, of architecture at Oxford Brookes University and founder and director of the Oxford Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, he has uh, published quite extensively on the issue of sustainability and sustainable cities. And finally, our last speaker, who may not necessarily be in your program, uh, is Emmanuel uh, Balamont, uh, who is a senior design partner at Jean Nouffel and Associates. Uh, he has, in fact, uh, contributed to uh, many of the Nouvelle projects, including the National Institute for Scientific and technical information in non sea the Tokyo Opera Competition, and the Lyon Opera House. Um, one of the other interesting things that I think he did was he led a landmark shantytown regeneration project uh, in Salvador de Bahia in Brazil uh, back in the 90s. Um, we will start uh, with Will Alsop. Is this work? Oh, it is working. Yes, it does. Good. Um, well, th thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to correct two things Go in ahead. the presentation. Uh, RMJM is nothing to do with me, <laughs> okay. uh, which is important, and we have a new, a new company called All, and we're architects in Chongqing, London, and Toronto. The second thing is, I'd like to say, is I'm not an expert in anything, okay? okay. And it's taken me quite a long time to reach that position where I'm very happy not to be an expert in anything. So, on with the show. Now, many of the things I'm going to say have already been said, but that's because other people have already talked, and it's always like that, of course. But, um, you know, here is a place... Oh, no, I want to say something else before that. I think it's extraordinary that with globalization, uh, which we all know about, we're all a part of, and we all suffer from, and all enjoy at the same time, I find it extraordinary that as we have more and more global globalization, we have a fragmentation of cities. So Yugoslavia is now broken down into four or five different countries, um, and it would appear that, the, uh, the, that people want to rediscover their identities through their sort of nationalism um, in the face of globalization. I think one is a result of the other, you know, that they want to reestablish. So actually, if, as I believe, 
it is very important to have that local identity, local culture, whatever you like to call it, and maybe we'll explore that later on, um, that the more global we become, the more particular and located on the surface of the earth we want to be. And that even includes places like Scotland, <laughs> maybe shortly followed by Cornwall, who knows. As a Londoner, I think it's a great idea to get rid of all these places. <laughs> However, some of you might know where this is. I don't. <laughs> some of you might know where that is. And apart from the mountain in the background, which is a bit of a giveaway, <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily know where that is. In other words, they all look the same. And I think that's a problem. And we'll explore that a bit further. But this loss of identity is really quite a serious problem in so far that it leads to bad behavior. And I'm sure that will come out. How people behave living in these places has got worse, not better. And I think that there are a number of reasons for that. But on the other hand, let's look at the other side. There's someone like, this is Australia. Lots of Australia look just like that. <laughs> Red and no one in it. Mm -hmm. But they got very worried because obviously Australia was very tied to the United Kingdom for a long time and they thought they should have their own identity. So what are they? they gave up the UK and the European connection and they just replaced it with California. Except for one man, um, and there are others actually to be fair, but Glenn Merkitt I think is the only Australian architect that actually has managed to play with a sort of vernacular which you could call Australian because I wouldn't see this and some of his other works are anywhere else. But it only tends to translate in very small scale work like the scale of the single house or a series of small houses. When it's translated to the city, it doesn't work and he had the intelligence not to take on large commissions in cities and that's good and he has a very nice life and uh, enjoys what he does. And I think architects enjoying what they do is is absolutely critical to the success of giving more identity to some of these places that uh, are around, around the world. Because we feel insignificant. Now, we can say some of those first three images, like the, the, the various sort of nondescript cities that we see, which are trying not to be nondescript, you know, is a result in part of technology. And you know, air conditioning is, means you can build the same thing anywhere in the world and you just deal with it with technology, which we all know is not very sustainable, a word that I promised myself not to use. But um, I did. But why is it at this time when there is no predominant architectural style, particularly, um, I, I think there's a vast number of very talented, very creative architects. There's a desire from the people to have things that are different. We have a range of technologies and a range of materials that every building in the world, I'm exaggerating here of course, could be completely different. And yet we seem to be going in the reverse direction. Why is that? Well, these two words, both very good words, best practice, on their own these words are good words. Best is good and practice is all right, it's like tennis. But put together, best practice is one of the culprits, I think. You know, that you hear, I'm sure we all hear in this room from time to time, people say, we must go for best practice. What does that really mean? It means we look for the most successful thing, whether it's an office block or a housing development or whatever it is, and see if that was successful, then we'll repeat it. So there's no room for any change. It reduces the, 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 the position of, of, of local people having a say, and it reduces the creativity and inventiveness of the architects and clients as well. So I think that's, that's a very important point. We should just ban the words best practice. I prefer worst practice would be, would be really quite interesting in a way. <laughs> Look, I don't know where this is either, but it's what people like. Now, the curious thing is you can't build this because obviously age has something to do with the delight that we get. It's comfortable, it's not designed, but I think there is a clue in how it came about. It was, it evolved. Just evolution is quite good, which I do have to question one of the things that came up in the earlier session today, you know, the notion of the master plan. I think the master plan is one of the culprits 
because people do master plans and that brings out another whole load of experts, you know, urban designers, planners and all the rest of it, who think that they have a solution. Well, we only have to look around the world and you see they don't have a solution. But what a master plan does, which you then have to adhere to, then actually st it just um, cements and actually puts in aspect one sort of area of the, of the land and there's no room for any real deb well, there's always room for debate but you might lose the job if you go too too far on this that is clearly not right therefore i'd like to question the master plan as a, as a device which actually results in some of the problems which i think most of the people will have were discussed by angela and um, and, and certainly i think uh, probably share with 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 many of you remember the word vernacular <laughs> Prince Charles was very keen on vernacular. You can't build the vernacular. The vernacular is what we actually do today and we have many things available to us. But inherent within the word vernacular, of course, is a sense of, um, of comfort, appropriateness, coziness. Coziness, a word that architects never use. I don't know why. You know, they prefer to be uncomfortable and, uh, and, and rather sort of... Um, antiseptic really on the whole I don't think that's a good thing in other words you can do all sorts of things and there are no or there are fewer and fewer rules and as the rules get less we seem to be more restricted so we're only doing as a series of architects designers um, urban designers whatever we like to call ourselves you know one small fraction of what we could do There's these sort of horrible attempts to actually be culturally significant. What that means is you build a bog standard building and you put a funny top on it. So you can have a, an Arabian top, you can have a Chinese top, you can have a New York top, but actually everything else about the building is the same and what happens at the ground floor is usually a disaster, but uh, is also much the same. Well, look, must be the golf club in the middle. <laughs> Why do we do that? You know, it's not necessary. And it's certainly what you might call a token gesture in the worst sense of those words. Shanghai, a little bit of Russia plonked in there on the left, a gift from Russia. And then Jim Mai Ta, which I actually, with my SOM, I, I quite like it actually. You know, it's nice. but. It, it's driven by an idea of an interpretation of what is Chinese. Well, maybe high-rise is just not Chinese, or indeed a number of other places. You can do other things. There's no need to do high-rise in particular. I'm not that I'm against it myself, but I think there are other options and other solutions, and we all know why, how it comes into being. I mean, you can take a place like Singapore here, and you can work low-rise, and you can revitalize places. This is my project in Clark Key. You know, where my client, all those shop houses are actually virtually, or well, they were virtually brand new buildings. They rebuilt it, and it's a place for the stomach, which I, I, I like, as you can tell. You know, for eating, drinking, dancing, clubbing, and all the rest of it, a place for tourists. And they built these shop houses in the belief that if you make something local and locally relevant and use the tradition and rebuild it, that will attract people. Well, no one went. So they said, what can you do? So it's very easy. It rains every day, and if you in, in, in Singapore, if you get wet, you never get dry. So you put a big umbrella there. You put a lot of the people eating by the river, which is what you want, and it just feels comfortable. So now it's full. It's very simple. It's just common sense, and not following any particular rules. Except, well, there's one rule I will pass on to you: that if you want people to sit and eat and spend time eating, they have to sit about this height above the main thoroughfare. Then they feel they're slightly apart. So it's the rule of what I call the 15 centimeter, 15 centimeter rule. And it doesn't matter whether it's part of a street or, in fact, a bar. Where you eat needs to feel slightly separate from where people are standing. Vertical drinking, I think they, 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 I believe they call it. So we do have an identity crisis. I'm just trying to speed up because you're going to stop me any minute. Um, what do we do about it? Civic pride is a very powerful thing. How do you engender civ civic pride? How do you get that? There's only one way, is to work with people. 
No, not with agents. Are they? I don't know if there are any agents in the room, but you're, you're part of the problem, I have to say, <laughs> if you are. <laughs> a very significant part of the problem because you're risk-averse, and risk-aversion is also an enemy of what we would like. We'd like to have more, more diversity and all these other things, um, and that doesn't work either. We should take risks. So here, working in Croydon, one of my favorite places, a suburb of London, for those that you don't know, um, but a very particular place, slightly worn out, but we worked with the people to ask them what sort of town they would like. It's a very simple question. But you don't ask them, you don't tick a box. You know, public consultation has become a, a box ticking exercise, which is useless. You've got to engage various bits of the community, you know, the police, the young people, the old people, the business people, the politicians, and you get them to do your work. You get them to draw, you get them to dream. And what you discover is unlike, and this is why some of the things that some uh, one architect in this room I can see particularly, you know, they are not a risk because they listen and then you, you work in a very open way. And that doesn't matter about an RIBA award or any other award for that, for that matter. What does matter is doing something where people at the beginning are smiling and the possibility when you start, when you've actually built something, created this place, they'll still be smiling, you know, because it takes a long time to build places, and that's a part of our life. So you can't say I'm going to suspend life for five years; it's all the way through. So how you go about these things is vital, and it should always be enjoyable. So, really to sum up, I'd say no to the word context idea having people the number of times as an architect in particular people say well how does that fit in with the context and you say well it doesn't but just look at the context is that what you want it to be like no thank you so that's a mean it's a meaningless sort of uh, qualification on what we do or desire consistency that's another no word I think consistency why you know why would you want to build something that's consistent with the crap next door, or in the next block, or whatever. Listen to the people, yes. Work with the people, they are innately creative. And your job, in part, is to interpret, in a good way, what they are saying and what they're drawing. It's very simple. There's nothing, no rocket science to this, but it's surprising how people don't do that. And invent, and dare to be wrong. Nothing's here forever, so that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, we move on to Beatrice. And actually, there is, by the way, a uh, clock over there. I'm just telling that to all of my speakers. You can see it. Okay, Beatrice. Sorry, I don't have any slides. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with such esteemed panelists and also audience. Um, I'm not an architect, um, I'm a curator and I started off as a journalist. Um, so my, uh, what I'm gonna be presenting is a kind, of, uh, a kind of approach to spatial practice, which is something, uh, a kind of terminology that expands architecture into different realms, um, different activities that are kind of valid as, uh, as influential architecture, but not necessarily resulting in building or not necessarily um, being the end product, being a building. Um, I think this panel is a very interesting and relevant uh, topic. Um, we're living in an age where corporations are more powerful than governments and uh, shoppers seem to have more power than voters. Um, and from my experience um, as a writer and in my recent experience um, working in cities across the world, um, making exhibitions and commissioning temporary structures and working on uh, spontaneous uh, activities and workshops um, related to bringing architecture to more local situations. Um, I'm going to give a few examples of architecture that engages in um, individuality, in place, in localism. Um, architecture that is, is critical and um, political, that's socially engaged. And it's the difference between affirmative design, 
um, and critical design that I think is really crucial. And I think affirmative design is, is the stuff that Will was talking about, the, the reproduction and the, the kind of bland uh, sort of rep repetition um, in cities uh, that sort of goes hand in hand with uh, globalization. And, and critical design, which is much harder and much more elusive and, um, and not really related to the activities um, of architects. It's taken on by what I call spatial practitioners. Um, I also wanted to just sort of highlight the, um, the award of the Pritzker Prize to Wang Xu, the Chinese architect, um, which I think also really um, marks this a key, a key moment in, in, and a key signifier into what we should be doing in China, where you have an architect like Wang Xu who um, spent 10 years working on a building site, learning his craft, um, and now, you know, is building, is building incredibly important and influential structures in China that should really be marking um, an age where China builds, China has its own architects and doesn't really import architects in the way that we do at the moment. But critical design uh, is what I want to talk about, and it's not always represented um, in that way, uh, like Wang Xu with a final project, but it includes things like writing um, as a method of engagement and, and knowledge production, such as these kind of talks, um, which are influential and do have an impact. Um, and um, I suppose it's something about this idea of interdisciplinarity, of agency, um, that could be a building site, it could be the, the type of work that takes place before the building happens, it could be a publication that informs the local community of what will be taking place or engages in some critical thinking um, a long time before any structure takes place or any commissioning takes place. It could be a citywide biennale, uh, which is something that I've been working a lot on in the last few years. Um, uh, a biennale is, the, is, a, is an event that um, engages in all kinds of architecture all across the city and involves exhibitions, involves conferences, involves commissioning works. And I think the, the opportunity of something temporary and something that um, can really explore current issues and very, be very responsive and very active is an incredible opportunity um, to engage in localism and to really address some of the issues that we've been failing on. Um, and I, I really believe in the Biennale or the exhibition as a great site for that. Um, the first example I probably want to give is something that you may know about already, but um, in Tirana, um, the, the mayor, who was um, an artist, decided that there was such a problem in Tirana of, um, of people just being so depressed and so unhappy with unemployment and not engaging in their city, and he thought that it would be a good idea to, to start painting the buildings. And he painted streets of buildings, bright orange, stripy, you know, all sorts of colours. And people painted their own buildings. And suddenly there was an incredible passion and pride um, that, that happened just by picking up a paintbrush. Um, the Tirana Biennale in 2003 invited Hans Ulrich Albrecht, um, a curator from London, uh, to, to engage further in this programme of painting. And he commissioned contemporary artists to take the facades and paint the facades. And again, and then Tirana became this kind of global focus of artists and architecture who are so enthusiastic and so kind of passionate about their city. Um, and this is also the possibility of the Biennale to have a long-term effect, not just to be a kind of hit and run event, um, but something that really engages with the local and really leaves something behind. Um, there are also, you know, I, I would also kind of disagree with the idea of looking back as a, as a great way of being local. What about looking forward? What about using new technologies to engage local people? Um, the Wiki Bivouac um, is a data aggregator. Um, it kind of, it's a project that started in America and, um, and Paris. And they have mapped all the possible urban spaces. This young group of people have mapped all the possible urban spaces and have made a website where people can say, oh, this is an empty space. I've got an idea of what to do with it. And engaging in different ways of accessing people who know about their city and would like to do something with their city. And how can you reach them? Well, quite a good way is the internet. Um, similarly, um, engaging in mayors in, in, in the kind of... Um, in the political urban think tank who are based in Caracas, between Caracas and New York. Also, many of you will have heard of their work. Um, and that started with a, with a campaign and a research project. Way before any building took place, they were, they were academics and researchers looking into the condition of favelas 
and what they could do. And through their research, which again wasn't intended to have an output, um, they campaigned with the mayor and they managed to build um, a vertical gym which was attributed with reducing the crime rate um, in the city by 30% in its local area and by providing an alternative of things things for young people to do. Um, and then a few years later they built a monorail which gave um, the opportunity for people in the favelas who are very, very distant from the main city to have access to schools and hospitals um, through this kind of amazing monorail which weaved its way through this mountain. Similarly, in, back in London, um, the mayor's programme for 100 public spaces, um, Ken Livingstone and Richard Rogers, also had um, a great philosophy behind it and in, engaging with um, the local cities and the local citizens. Um, Muff's project in Barking Town Square um, has also been attributed with really generating a lot of interest in this quite deprived area of Barking um, and whether that interest can really um, transform itself into something else is a different matter but it's, it's, the, it's been, Barking has been the intense subject of the idea of a temporary solution of trying to engage people in short term way um, to, to really try and understand their city and be kind of local and have a kind of a marketplace or a place where they can connect to each other. Um, in London, again, the, this idea of the big society um, has been very important, um, very influential um, from, from, the, from the Conservative government who want to take as little responsibility as possible for um, the social realm or the public realm and want to hand it over to, um, to the private um, developers. Well, this might sound like quite a bad idea, but actually has um, a practice called Architecture Zero Zero have really embraced this and really taken a very responsible kind of corporate responsibility to a new level by um, examining the civic economy as a, some, as, as a way of local people working together, um, businesses, local citizens, to participate in the growth of their own places. So there's things like um, the market in Brixton, um, a kind of public supermarket in Brixton, which was built together with local leaders and also with the help of the government and also with the help of private companies. Um, a superhero supply company, um, which was an empty shop, which then became um, a kind of a storefront for Dave Eggers, the author, um, to teach uh, local people how to read because there was a real a real sort of dearth of um, reading and, and writing skills in that area. Um, and this was also done with help of, of corporate responsibility and, and with support of um, uh, businesses. The Meanwhile Space in London, the Architecture Foundation, the idea of fab labs, um, which are, you know, basically a kind of physical YouTube where you can go to a fab lab. Um, there's one in Manchester, I think that's the main one at the moment. And you can go there, you can make stuff, you can put, we'll learn how to put together um, a circuit, you can make your own Arduino, you can make your own um, speaker system. Um, and these are all kind of activities which are funded um, in part between corporate and part between politics. Um, and so I'm kind of wrapping up now. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what, my, what I'm doing um, in relation to all this stuff. Um, in 2008, I was um, working at Icon magazine, which is a, a London-based architecture and design magazine. Um, and we published um, an issue on activist architects. And we interviewed about 10, 10 of the most important people who are working in what we described as activism. Um, and this issue was, was a very important moment, I think, um, in terms of, of making this kind of practice, um, uh, giving it a platform and, and really acknowledging it and promoting it. Um, I moved to China in 2009 and I worked on the Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale, um, which was a very curious situation where the city government, city of China, the sort of city of Shenzhen, were desperate to have a kind of cultural identity. They had this massive city of 15 million, um, but they didn't really have any cultural credibility, unlike Hong Kong, its really cool next door neighbour. So they wanted to associate themselves with Hong Kong by having the Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale and by bringing in um, international curators. Um, I work with a lot of really interesting architects. Um, I work with parkour artists. We grew food into, in the main kind of city block. We, have, we had a sponsor from um, a major shopping mall and we used the whole, they gave us the whole site to use as, um, a kind of, as an exhibition space, which worked really well. Um, and we work with schools, we work with children, um, we work with local communities. In Guangzhou, in South Korea, um, I had a Biennale, the Guangzhou Biennale last year, 
Um, again, the Guangzhou Biennale um, was mainly an art biennale and has been designed recently. And it was founded because um, the mayor of Guangzhou really also believed in this idea of cultural regeneration. Um, I commissioned a number of pieces, um, one of which has worked internationally and has its own life now, which is called the Wiki House. And the Wiki House um, is a project that um, uses open source technology so people could download their own house and print it on a CNC milling machine. And they've had, since this was an exhibition project, um, which we fund, seed funded, um, this has actually been published in Wired magazine. It's been all over the world. Um, they're building versions of this. They want, they've been in touch with people from America who are looking at kind of post-earthquake or post-disaster, how they can use this. And that started off as an exhibition piece. Um, in London, I've co-founded the Gopher Hole, um, which is um, a, a very small gallery, um, but our intention is to provide a platform for young designers or architects who don't really have a place to show their work. Um, so this means people who might be working between disciplines, between art and architecture, between design and architecture, psychology, sociology, anthropology. Um, if they've got a good idea, then they can approach us and we'll provide a platform for it. Um, my main project um, at the moment is the Lisbon Architecture Triennial, which opens in the end of 2013. Um, and we're examining the idea of agency, um, plurality, multidisciplinarity, and intimacy as a way of architectural practice. Um, our main, um, one of our main sort of open projects is a grants program where we'll be giving grants, small grants between 500 euros and 2,500 euros to encourage young people or encourage people who have ideas about how to engage in their city um, to apply for these grants and to, um, and to work on a project which they believe um, can really contribute to the to local environment as we have um, a lot of uh, social issues in Portugal at the moment related to the crisis and we, want, we don't want to have that idea of an exhibition that comes in and then leaves without having a trace. Um, so that's all I have to say today. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> Hope you. You can come to Lisbon. <laughs> okay, we move to Mike. Thank you very much. Um, I see the timing is just about to start. Uh, okay. Um, I'm taking a bit of a risk uh, because I'm putting a slightly contrarian view about a clash of globalization and local culture. Um, and uh, in order to make sure I stick to time, I'm going to take it from a paper. So please bear with me uh, for this. It is only 15 minutes. So, so please stay, because there's a really great speaker to follow me. Um, what I want to do is make a very simple point um, and perhaps raise a question or two. And I think the best way is to use a city as an example. I shall use a world city that's facing population growth, fairly rapid urbanization, and that's feeling the pressures of globalization. Could be many different cities, but I've chosen to look at Bangkok. This talk is more of a metaphor and a narrative about cities than simply about Bangkok. It's just a vehicle to tell a story. Now, bringing identity back does have an assumption that has already been lost through globalization. And I wonder actually how true this is. Of course, there are plenty of truisms about the ubiquity and spread of globalization. Um, so many it's hardly worth quoting, but here you go. Uh, whether you walk through the streets of New York or Nairobi, Beijing or Buenos Aires, globalization has introduced a level of commercial culture which is eerily homogenous. The glittering air-conditioned shopping malls are interchangeable. Young people drink the same soft drinks, wear the same identical branded clothing, play the same computer games, and so on. And of course, the argument has gone as far as the physical look of our cities, homogenized with similar central business districts, high-rise, the corporate H quarters, the banks, the financial institutions. It could be anywhere environment. Globalization has come to be argued uh, is equated completely with the loss of local identity. Well, walking around in Bangkok, I was actually stopped dead by seeing something that was unusual. It, it wasn't just the McDonald's with its large model of a red-headed clown giving a crude gesture of the Thai Y of greeting. No, it was its product. 
It was the Mac Thai Sticky Rice Roast Pork Burger, a product claimed to have locally sourced ingredients and to cater for Thai tastes. So what of that much vaunted ubiquity of McDonald's, that symbol of globalization, the all-conquering products that are the same everywhere in the world, in fact, so much the same everywhere in the world, that the Big Mac has been used as an indicator by economists of the health of world currency. It's called purchasing power parity, the Big Mac index, or Bergonomics. So what of globalization's all-conquering imperial reach? If McDonald's bends to local and regional tastes, what exactly is going on? Well, there's another level to this story, literally another level to this story. When I stop to ponder the sticky rice roast pork burger, and it's not very nice and it's very difficult to say, I was looking down on McDonald's from a height, from one of Bangkok's skywalks. And let me explain. The second thing that Bangkok is most notorious for is its traffic congestion, with lengthy traffic jams, journeys taking often more than two hours or more, pollution, general chaos, on limited road space. 20 years ago, they recognized they needed a solution and decided to build a mass rapid transit system. It was opened in 1999 to coincide with the king's 72nd birthday, officially known as the elevated train in commemoration of His Majesty the King's sixth cycle birthday. In Thailand, a cycle is 12 years. Well, it's commonly called the Sky Train. This is a massive, raised, concrete structure, some four or five stories above the ground, constructed over the existing streets, so it had no impact on the layout and form of the city, keeping its traditional configuration. Not a thing of beauty, but it has an undeniable presence, and also it has an identity all of its own. The technology is global. The funding was through a local company, although no doubt with a vast amount of global capital. And just for your information, it's a system of two lines, 30 stations, about 30 kilometers of track. Since it opened in five years after, after it opened, an underground was inaugurated, and that has three interchanges between five stories up in the air and five stories below in an underground system. It's quite a, quite a way to get there. And then, two years ago, another elevated line was connecting the SkyTrain to the international airport some 28 kilometers away. But it's the SkyTrain and what it connects to that grabs the attention. At its heart, that is to say, about a third of its stations, it links directly to an international, globalized world at high level via 27 sky bridges. These connect to major hotels, some 75 plus, huge shopping malls, a dozen or more, entertainment, conference venues, and commercial buildings. And three of its stations at the center are further linked by the skywalk, slung underneath the tracks, so that even more sky bridges can be built in between the stations to connect to other global buildings. And so powerful is this global pull that many of the hotels that don't have a skywalk link or aren't very close by have free transport, usually a little tuk-tuk, they call them rickshaws, three-wheelers, making a lot of noise, to whisk guests from their international hotel to the globalized world of the sky train. And it is a globalized world. It is the other, apart from, but physically within Bangkok. Up there, above the city, are the same shops, the same style of international hotels, all strangely familiar, and that could be, indeed, almost anywhere, reinforcing the homogeneity of globalization and a certain loss of local identity. The fast, frequent, smooth, air-conditioned transport speeds above the streets and traffic of Bangkok. From air-conditioned train to air-conditioned shopping mall, there's no need to experience the discomfort of climate, or of traffic, or of the poor. 
because, of course, not only is it a globalized world, but it is a world that excludes. You are literally above it all. Down below, you enter the other world, Thailand and Bangkok, and it is a world away. Below are the ground floors of the very same buildings that are connected to the sky bridges up above. They can be easily accessed at street level, but it's not the same. The streets, as you know, in Asian cities are crowded and vibrant with life. Street traders, hawkers, food stalls, even mobile restaurants vie with the traffic congestion, pollution and noise. Getting around down there is slow, crowded and hot, but everywhere is connected. And there's a bewildering choice from not too expensive to very cheap, from the relatively safe to the incredibly dangerous, that's the taxis, the buses, the tuk-tuks, and the motorcycle taxis, which are great fun, but you take your life into your hands if you get on one. So within a small radius, what do you find? You find the night markets, you find the food stalls, you find the restaurants of all varieties and all prices, apartments, traditional housing, temples, different ethnic areas, and of course the first thing that Bangkok is most notorious for. It's inclusive, varied, diverse, and above all, alive and interesting. And yet, despite that diversity, Thai, Thai culture prevails in obvious ways. In many corners and spaces, there'll be a small shrine with food and flowers placed there every day. Temples are interspersed in among the new buildings and are magnets that make no concessions to the global world above. And of course, global culture is also there. Outside the shopping malls, almost everything you can buy within them, you can buy outside for next to nothing from the street traders. The expertise in faking goods is awesome, and it happens very fast. To all appearances, you have two different worlds existing side by side, or in this narrative, one above the other. Here, buildings inhabit the same space, the same street pattern, the same form. Above is the air-conditioned global world with its own homogenous identity. Below is the untidy reality of local culture, and above all, its local identity. So returning to the theme of this session, bringing back identity and the impact of globalization and regionalism, of course it has a huge impact. Global finance, technology, built Bangkok Skytrain and other rapid transit. Many buildings that line the streets, the high-rise, the shopping malls, the goods, the products within them, the banks and Global HQ could not have been constructed that way without it. It happens and it's fairly unstoppable. But apart from their height, and superficial style, globalization has not affected the physical form of Bangkok. The Skytrain, the example I'm using, follows the pattern of the existing streets, not the other way around. And it doesn't really matter what the buildings are like, or whether they're global or international in style, or whether they have a regional feel, or even if they're regenerated. The streets, the spaces, the urban environment is inhabited and overwhelmed by the local by Thai culture and behavior, sometimes influenced by the global, but having an intense local identity. Looking down at McDonald's from the skywalk, and also at a temple 50 meters away, the two worlds coexist. Temple makes no concessions. The street vendors make and sell offerings of flowers and incense. The ceremonies and rituals are there for all to see. The identity is Thai, traditional, and special. It could not be anywhere. No. It's McDonald's that has made the concession with its sticky rice roast pork burger. Despite its efforts to bend Thai cultures and tastes, it's comfortingly empty. So the two worlds, the global and the local, exist side by side, sometimes interacting, sometimes separate. One can't exist without the other. But it is not, as the truism suggests, that globalization is always the winner always thrusting the local aside. Nor is it true that everywhere has been made to look the same. Whilst globalization produces buildings and global businesses, it is the local people and their culture that makes the city and makes Bangkok what it is. It is this that gives its identity. It's local, perhaps regional, and it could not be anywhere else. So I'm not sure about bringing back identity. After all, who is to bring it back? 
and whose interpretation of culture or image might it be? No, I suggest it's not been lost, but it has evolved. Identity is mediated by those who use their city. It is their culture, their imagination, creativity and enterprise that mold it to become their own. And I wonder if the same can be told of other cities. Thank you very much, Mike. We now move to Manuel. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, Mike put some pressure on me, saying, uh, but well, I will try to do my best. Uh, and I'm sorry, I want to apologize. Maybe Will was right. I will repeat some things that uh, was already said, but that's the risk being the last one to speak. Um, well, in the middle of the 20th century, I think that uh, this is a story that uh, everybody here knows. The world suffered a major change. Uh, when millions of peoples uh, decided that their home were not suitable anymore. They wanted to change, not because they wanted just uh, to make it fun, but because they needed to. And they decided to leave their farms, their village, and come to cities. Unfortunately, these old cities were not prepared to this shock. And uh, what had to happen, happened. They were not accepted, and they were not well uh, welcomed. So they did this. And little by little, things were getting better, and they did that. When I s look at that, and I'm thinking about what demographic experts say to us, uh, in less than 40 years from now, there will be 50% people more on this planet. That means from six to seven, it's going to nine billion people. And from these nine billion people, more than 70% will live in such uh, cities, because we have to call that cities. Uh, when we look at these pictures from our point of view, we say, well, this is a nightmare. It appears to be a nightmare for police department, for uh, energy and water supply companies, and it's, of course, a ni nightmare for planners, for politicians, for urbanists, architects, and probably also for the people who live in it. But I will talk about that later. So the response that the, our society gave to those people was something like that, much better. Uh, I agree with Will Alsop when, I, when he said, well, I don't know what it is. I, I, don't, I don't know either what it is. Well, I do because I, I choose the pictures, but I would like to, and because he will say that much better than me, I would like to read to you uh, some parts of a text that was wrote, written by uh, Jean Nouvel in 2005, because it, it's absolutely related to what we are talking about, and as I said, he said it much better than me. I hope it won't be too boring listening to someone who is reading. I, I will try to be f fast. With this, it will be better. Now, more than ever, architecture is annihilating places, banalizing them, violating them. Architecture is by no means spared by the new conditions of an efficient, profitable world increasingly mar marked by an ideology delivered as the baggage of the economy. The global economy is accentuating the effects of the dominant architecture, the type that claims we don't need context. I'm sorry, well, I'm using this word to you. It's no word, uh, as I understood. And yet the de debate on this galloping frenzy does not exist. Architectural criticism invoking the limits of the discipline is content with aesthetic and stylistic reflections, devoid of any analysis of the real 
and ignores the crucial historical clash that more is insistently every day sets a global architecture ag against an architecture of situations. Generic architecture against an architecture of specificity. Is our modernity today simply the direct descendant of the modernity of the 20th century, devoid of any spirit of criticism? Does it consist simply of parachuting solitary objects onto the face of the planet? Shouldn't, be, shouldn't it rather be looking for reasons, correspondences, harmonies, differences, in order to propose an ad hoc architecture here and now? Undoubtedly, this confrontation runs deeper and is more complex than the issue of local, local against global. Specificity is linked to the actualization of knowledge. Architectural knowledge is by nature diverse, given its links with all civilization. In the name of the pleasure of living on this earth, we must resist, resist to the urbanism of zones, networks, and grids. The automatic road that is obliterating, obliterating the identity of the cities of all continents in all climates, feeding on cloned offices, cloned dwellings, cloned shops, thirsting for the already sought, the already seen, in order to avoid thinking and seeing. We must replace these generic rules, territorial, territorial and architectural, with other rules based on the structural anal analysis of the lived landscape. We must establish sensitive, poetic rules, approaches that will speak of colors, essences, characters, the anomalies of the act of creation, the specificities of rain, wind, sea, and mountain, rules that speak of the temporal and spatial continuum that will turn the tide towards a mutation, a modification of the inherited chaos, and take account of all the fractal scale of our cities. These sensitive rules cannot but defy the generic ideology that leads to the proliferation of hegemonic dominant technologies, creating dependencies, thus tending to epitrophy all our networks of transport energy to go for the bottom line. By contrast, the ideology of the specific aspires to autonomy, to the use of the resources of the place at the time, to the privileging of the non-material, how can we use what is here and nowhere else? How can we differentiate without caricaturing? How can we achieve depth? Architectural design on the large scale does not mean inventing ex nihilo. Architecture means transformation, organizing, organizing the mutations of what is already there. Architecture means encouraging the embedding in the, land, in the landscape of places that anyway have a tendency to invent themselves. It means to reveal, to give direction. It means prolonging lived history and its traces of past lives. It means listening to the breathing of a living place, to its pulsations. It means interpreting, interpreting its rhythms in order to create. Maybe I will be shorter because it, I'm going to the end. And it's a long test. Uh, just we'll go to one of the last sentences. To see the beauty of the precariousness of poverty is not to forget the desperate conditions. It is simply to see the power and dignity of life in extreme situations and to experience the unplumbed depths of humanity to be found here we began to understand why the inhabitants of shanty towns of, and favelas have preferred their makeshift, precious, aleatory, evolving homes to rows of concrete lockers formatted, formatted as high-density living machines, etc., etc. I, I will stop here because it brings me back to my early pictures. This one. As I, say, uh, I said, it, it appears to be a nightmare, even for people who lived in it. As a matter of, of fact, it's not true. 
uh, I think there's a lot to learn from this and those people. If you ask them, do you want to move for, for, uh, to one of these uh, nice concrete box that we planners, architects, politicians are designing for you? They say no, definitely no. And probably 99% of them will say no. Why, is, why, why, is, why are they so uh, attached to this, which appears to be to, uh, for us a nightmare? Well, it, they are attached to it because it looks like them. And it is, this is not a negative idea. Well, for my part, I think it's a beautiful picture. Of course, it's a terrible picture. Because behind this, there's a lot of problems. A uh, lot of disease, a lot of criminality, a lot of any, any problem of any kind. Because it is made of men, of humanity. It's mainly made of humanity, which is not the case of this. So when you ask to these people, why do, if you want to move, they say no. They say no because this was built by their hand. They built this with the knowledge they, they get from their parents. It looks like heritage in a certain kind of way. Uh, they say no because it's based about, upon relationship, upon how I'm living with my neighbors. When, I, when my daughter or my son will marry, I will build something on the top of my house. And I'm creating the link between me and my environment. I mean my human environment. So it's a little bit too easy to say, we have to rip this from the surface of the earth. No, I think we have to learn a lot from this. And we can even say, if we are aware, to, if we, if we uh, know a little bit about the, uh, this kind of development, we can even say where it is located, which was not the case um, on the, the pictures that was in reality in China, the first one. If you know a little bit about this, you can see that this is Brazil, and this also is Brazil. This also is, Bra is Brazil, and everybody could say it is Brazil. Why? Because everybody, almost everybody, is, uh, uh, has seen this kind of picture somewhere. And it remains in our, in our minds. Uh, the first one, the one in China, we, already, we, we all have seen them, but they all look the same. It's so difficult to remember anything distinctive from them. This one is not Brazil, it's India. And you, you can see it's very, very different. And this one is South Africa. Well, this one is China once more, but uh, <laughs> Will also said uh, just uh, a few moments ago that probably high rise is not Chinese. Well, this is China, and and it was demolished 20 years ago. So, it, it, and it was built by by the people who lived there. So it, it's interesting because this really on this picture appears to be really some kind of nightmare. But in fact, if you look at this very interesting drawing, this is a uh, Kowloon uh, uh, walled city in, in uh, Hong Kong. If you look at this very interesting drawing that was uh, made by a Japan team, uh, well, it's difficult to see it, but if you zoom in it, you can see that it's mainly made of humanity, of social activities. The form it takes doesn't import, of course, no one of people who lives here would like to live in Kuala Lumpur, walled city. But I think that even if we don't want to live in it and we don't want to reproduce it, we have to learn something from this. Well, back to what place is, I don't know. In, but th that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. 
Um, well, we actually have a good maybe half an hour or so for um, discussion and questions from the audience. My role is to try to engage the panelists uh, first by asking a few questions uh, and then open it to questions from the audience. I'm actually going to start um, by, by addressing my comments to both uh, Will and Emmanuel. Uh, Will, I think you issued us a very uh, provocative challenge, arguing against both context and consistency, and in favor of worst practices as opposed to best practices. I like that notion very much. Um, and, and basically, my, my, my issue or my question to you is, if in fact we go along with this suggestion, aren't people who live in a particular place that we design for context. And normally in practice, we actually discover that people who live in a particular place, uh, when they're often resistant to architects and planners' ideas, they invoke consistency as their principal frame of reference. So my, my, my question to you is, aren't those statements uh, that you made, uh, which are very brave statements, uh, the worst practices of globalization, if you will? Um, and let me, I'm, I'm going to have all of my questions and engage all of you in, in the discussion. Um, and, and again, going back to what uh, Emmanuel told us, um, you know, what people built in, in, in the favelas, and you actually showed us very good examples from all around the world, uh, this is in fact the vernacular, you know, it's what people do on their own, vernacular, in fact, the Latin origin of the term is what people build on their own, it's something that is built mainly for the masses and by the masses. Um, it is something that, as Will mentioned earlier, cannot really be designed by architects. So my question to you is, what are the lessons that can actually be learned uh, from the vernacular in practice, and particularly uh, from the different forms of the vernacular that may exist? You tried to show us that, well, look at these. It, it seems like we actually know what the places are, not necessarily by seeing what professional architects have managed to do in the creation of skyline of cities, but rather by looking at uh, the different forms of squatter settlements and informal housing that exists in these different places. Um, so it's as if you're suggesting that what makes the local local is what people do on their own. In a sense, I think that this also very much resonates with what Mike tried to say, um, which I fully agree with and endorse, but it left me somewhat uncomfortable because in your example of Bangkok, it seems that the global exists on top of the local. At least that happens to be the case in Bangkok. Um, and for me, this was almost reminiscent of Fritz Lang's beautiful film, uh, Metropolis, uh, 1927, where you know, those who controlled and had the power lived um, above ground, and those who had to uh, machine the world had to live below ground. So can we actually then use this very specific analogy of the above and below um, which seems to be inspired very much by Bangkok itself as a way of understanding the connection between the local and the global. And, and finally, to, to Beatrice, I, I, uh, I know that your work has very much involved activist architects. Um, and my question to you is, uh, to what extent do you see uh, among the activist architects that you particularly covered, and you know, the notion of even an activist architect, particularly in the United States today, is, is very seductive, particularly you know, to my students. Uh, do you see any particular understanding or definition of globalization that is deep enough um, to sort of base activism on? Or uh, are we seeing fundamentally different positions with regard to activism that are principally inspired uh, by locality, by where uh, people exist? So, Will, we'll start with you. I'm totally confused now. Um, <laughs> I think there are many things, if I can just sure. make some, some general comments. I mean, clearly one needs to be provocative in a, in a, on a platform like this, otherwise there's nothing to talk about. Um, but I do believe that um, uh, there are many things, if I can pick I was very interested in the, in the, the layered uh, description of Bangkok. And uh, certainly Bangkok, uh, I think, is, is fairly unique in that way. Although you can say as a model, if you're trying to integrate new stuff on top of old. It's not a bad model and can be done. And um, certainly I, I'm a great believer on things on legs and leaving the ground plane as it is. And I've done it in some places. And I don't know why other people don't do it. Um, but I, I think there's a very good example in, in, Man, in one of Manuel's pictures. Uh, I think it was China where there's numerous high-rise uh, residential buildings, um, virtually all the same. And of course, there's, there's a good example in those, that in the, in the floor plans of those, they have very st st 
deep insets in, 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 in those buildings because they have a rule that every room, including bathrooms, has to have natural ventilation. So they have to have a window, which seems a good idea. But not in China. It's a terrible idea because you end up with these very deep crevices going into these buildings to say nothing of the proximity of one building to another. And of course, in that climate, they just, you just get, they just fill, uh, they just fill with, with, with sort of disease and uh, fungi and everything else. You could say there's a sort of pattern of that they do evolve very, very quickly. But it's a rather nasty pattern that's better shaven off the face than keeping it on. It's a marvelous beard you have. But I do feel that there is then room, and I think we have to remind ourselves there is this thing called architecture and design, and there is not design. You know? And that for a lot, for many, many hundreds of years, of course, architects were not involved with most of those things like mass housing. You know, it just occurred, and you see again very good examples in some of your pictures, Manuel. And then you see, then architects have to invent a role for themselves, and one useful role. If we come on to the to the favelas, there's a man. I think his name is Stark, not Philippe Stark, but another Stark, who has worked for many, many years in Rio, in the favelas, but just doing what he calls micro urbanisation, i.e adding a window here, tearing down one building here, making a public space, making enough room for the odd game of football, and making it much more livable. And I think there is, certainly when it comes to being useful within those sorts of conditions, that's right. And I remember being consulted in, in Cape Town you know, about the new sort of housing to replace the townships. You say, well, why do you want to do that? Why would anyone move from the townships, which are have very bad conditions in, in many respects, but they are evolved villages in some ways with patterns, meeting places, all those other things into basically brick and concrete horrible things where we, we've all built those, we've all seen those, and we know that they don't work and they give lots of problems, and certainly one of those problems is a lack of identity. When they already have a place, which actually if you put in proper plumbing and electricity and other sort of devices to make life a bit more comfortable could continue to evolve and that's probably where they'd like to live. So often it's a question of the, of, of the of political choice or politics or the politicians saying this is what we have to do because they think that's what they ought to do. But actually in reality it's them trying to tick boxes in terms of the number of houses pro yes. uh, provided, how to get rid of what they see as a problem which is actually is an opportunity. And these are some of the very practical, very obvious things which I, I think we can do. But none of those things rely on context or any, any or consistency of any of those other things. It's about responding to the situation on hand rather than having a general response, which in, in, is really, in, in my view, having a general response, it's like, uh, which actually gives rise to many of the sins that we all endure. I'd just like to say one, one, one other thing that um, you know, it was referred to by Angela Brady earlier. Uh, there is a, a mass assumption which worries me that it's a good idea to in intensify the centre of our cities and to make them more and more dense. And we know that the, the idea of that is it reduces travel distance to work and everything else. And everyone says, oh, yeah, we must do that. But actually, I don't think it's possible. Because the, the land in most, particularly in, in the Western cities, and now increasingly in Chinese cities, is unaffordable. Therefore, the only things you can put there are people that actually can't afford. So it's only, it will be the wealthy living in the middle. And anyway, I don't see, if you stop and work with people, people are quite happy with suburbia or a village or whatever. And in many places, particularly in Europe, which is very dense compared with, say, Australia, um, then it's quite possible to have people distributed. And I think that we have to work at both ends of the scale, the intensification of the city, but not at the expense of forgetting where else you might build. Very good. Manuel? Yes. Uh, I want to say two things. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, I'm not proposing what I, sh uh, I showed to you uh, as a model to the cities of the 21st century. I'm just saying it will happen. Yes. Um, and I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't think it's a great thing. It's a fantastic thing. I've, I've just look at it and I'm trying to understand it. Just, just that. 
And uh, second thing, of course, I don't think that the only way is to let people do themselves their cities or their homes or their shopping centers. Otherwise, I would decide to make some other profession. I think they, we still need to some architects, probably. Uh, but I think we, we have to, to be more, um, to listen more and to look more to what happens. And if people are able to do some things uh, and we think that thing they are doing by themselves is valuable, then it would be an idiotic position to refuse it just because they, were, they are not architect, planners, or developers. Yeah. Mike. Uh, yes, just, um, just, just a quickie, because uh, uh, people are wanting to go, I think. Um, the, the story about Bangkok, upper and lower, uh, is a bit of an exaggeration. But I think the lesson to be learned is one of exclusion uh, of some of the um, buildings that are global. And if those at street level, and I think it is the street level that really counts, are inclusive, that is to say they allow for, um, uh, in the ground floors, enough variety, enough possibilities for low rental, small starters, and so on, as well as their global bits, you've got something that's happening. I, I really don't care what happens two or three stories above that. It's what happens at the street level that begins to give identity in life. Uh, and the only other very brief comment I have to make, um, I was really interested in the favelas, the slums, and so on. Um, one of the other reasons why people don't want to move from them is that they are of themselves a microeconomy. If you look at Dharavi in Mumbai, uh, it is the recycling center of that city. And it is a place where people both live and work. Uh, you can't, in a concrete box, uh, do anything but have a dormitory there. Uh, your business and your home is often in those favelas and slums. And no wonder they don't want to move, because they wouldn't have a livelihood if they did. Thank you. Beatrice? Um, I think you asked about the sort of the relationship between the globalization and, let's say, activism in yes. architecture. I mean, um, if you look at Archigram or Archizoom or Super Studio, this idea of a socially engaged architecture um, has been is basically as old as, as the hills, of and course. I think um, that's probably something important to mention. But I thought it was really interesting, this kind of irony that um, the idea of this kind of underdog architecture is actually a kind of a popular uh, aspiration for students at architecture school. Um, but I think um, the reality of, of the kind of practice that I believe in it is something that is is um, is much more local, and I've seen it operating in in China, in in the hutongs of, of China, where we, there's people campaigning to save hutongs and that would have been uh, demolished, or um, you know, in Korea, where people are also mapping the city and identifying. Um, there was a case of of foot and mouth, a very really difficult case of foot and mouth disease um, in South Korea, which was trying to be covered up by the government, who didn't want. Um, he didn't want to cause a kind of scare and um, it was actually much more serious than the government let on. And so a group of architects and some collaborators of them set up a website where people could use Google Maps to point out where they knew the infection was happening. Um, and so I believe that's a kind of a, a use of agency or a use of architecture mm -hmm. that is, is really local and is really important that those people have a voice and, and, and are, are used, let's say. I think that's probably... Oh, very good. Okay, we have five minutes for questions from the audience. Yes, go ahead. I, th I think the mic went in the back, so <laughs> okay, we'll, 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 we'll start the first question with you. Go ahead. Okay, um, my name's Sean Griffiths. I'm an architect uh, from a company called uh, FAT in London. And um, uh, from my point of view, uh, a lot of what, what was said here is, is totally unprovocative. Uh, and I don't mean that as a criticism, because I think a lot of it's absolutely common sense. And uh, it kind of certainly informs the thinking uh, that underlies uh, our practice, where we're trying to create an architecture that's influenced by the vernacular, uh, is diverse, uh, is inclusive, uh, is uh, characterized by multiplicity. Um, but um, I, I'm not one of the world's most successful architects, because whenever I try to show this work 
to uh, the development community. I find myself uh, coming second in the competition because it's interesting, but not first, because you couldn't possibly do that. Uh, and I find uh, that there are certain uh, barriers to certain areas of work. For example, it would be impossible for somebody for me, like me to work in the city of London because I don't do glass office blocks. Why do the panel think that developers do this stuff and reject the kind of ideas that are being talked about uh, by the panel? Okay. I'll, I'll take two more questions and then open it up for the panel. Yes, the, can you give the mic here, please? Um, apart from complimenting all of you, but particularly Will also, because I think you began to roll your sleeves up on some of these topics in, in terms of being experiential, to talk, reminding us what we all feel experienced in cities. In, you talked in a slightly different way from, the, from much of the debate, and thanks a lot for that. And e even giving us the detail of the 150 millimeters is, is where some of this discussion should, I think, be going. But my question is quite different for all of you. Do you think, uh, where do you think religion fits into um, culture, heritage, identity, and obviously one could say culture, it, it, cultural activities, but biennales are the new religion or are part of, part of that. But, you know, it's a big subject. But I'd like to get some responses on okay. that. Okay. One more question. Yes. Hello, I'm from Shader Properties, and to begin, I wanted to thank everyone for their attendance and their excellent uh, discussion, so thank you. Um, I just a, a quick uh, question. Um, um, from everyone's discussion, there is uh, talk about uh, identity, lack of identity. When you look at imagery character of, of cities, you can't uh, make out what it is. And then there was, I think, from uh, Beatrice, a uh, mention of uh, social engagement and the power of connectivity and internet um, as, a, as, a, as a mode of that. So my, my question is, to me, when I look at all these images, I, I'm more of a referential aspect. I think of uh, Le Corbusier, Michelin for a living, Le, um, city, in the, uh, city in the park, the kind of things, opportunity. I mean, all of these came from noble ideas. But then there was uh, perhaps a misapplication of that, and, and and that happened. I mean, I'm a master planner. Will, you said the, the problems came from master planners. I'd like to take the ball back to architects, and I think perhaps it was noble ideas. Architects applied those ideas. Perhaps the, that were, you know, that's when the ball was dropped. Is it not? I mean, I would just like to engage the architecture um, of, of, of when is it form, when is it uh, aesthetic, and when is it actually a functional thing? When does it become more of the functionality of architecture that gives it the identity um, and the utility and not just a simple form and look which can e so easily be misinterpreted as pastiche? Thank you. Okay, I will go around the panel as a way of concluding this uh, by uh, basically allowing uh, everybody to have a, a response to any of the questions or to have a general statement. I will start with you, Will. Um, thank you. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think um, the very good questions, in a way, they're, they're interrelated. And if I just start off with responding to Sean, um, I know Sean's work very well, and I, I like the work very much. And he's right. He's a very creative, very interesting architect, and one of not so many, which um, I would like to see more of. And sadly, there's not enough of you and your company about. And you have to say, why is that? And it's for the very reasons that I, I, I try to outline in my brief, brief talk, that is that you're seen to be a risk. You know, and of course, a lot of, particularly in, on the private development side, it is market-led. And who advises the market? The agent. And I already outlined the agent. So you're a risk because what you build might not sell. But on the other hand, on the stuff that you have built, it's been extremely successful. And this is the great conundrum. Therefore, who is informing the investors and the developers in what type of architecture to go, apart from agents? And there is a rise, I have to say, particularly in the last 10 years, I'm talking more about the UK, but I've found it in other places as well, of these so-called sort of architectural cura curatorial types, no, nothing against you, my dear, um, who actually are advising people, who actually are not architects themselves, though so they might have an architectural degree, and they know nothing about what it's really like to do things. So I think we have to trust our architects. If we like what you do, 
I personally like what you do, um, then let's have more of it. And don't listen to the others who are actually tend to be the, no, I've got a better word for them, the tastemakers. And these are very dangerous people, tastemakers. They should not be allowed to interfere with the formation of our, uh, and evolution of our cities because they know nothing. They know nothing. Really, I mean, I'll say that again. They know nothing <laughs> at all. Um, but in a way, if there was more of you about and others like you, I think the question of religion would not be asked because it would just come out. And I'm very aware of, I live most of my time in, in, in London, which is a very diverse city. And there are lots of, I don't know how many religions there are represented, but many. And I, as far as I can see, they live cheek by jowl and people should be encouraged to uh, expose their spirituality in, in whatever way is, is, is appropriate it's within the context of, of those communities that live within those cities. The master plan, I seriously believe, is a problem because it tends to be fixed and we've become reliant. There's nothing, I, I prefer the word master vision, that there is a way to explore what a, a part of a city might be, but it's not fixed. It's just a step online to try and identify and help in something that will evolve over a period of time. And uh, you know, there is no, you're, you're always wrong, aren't you, in your master plans? Always. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, why should they last for a long time? They have, a, they have a shelf life of maybe six months or a year while things are discussed and then change. Thank you. Okay, Beatrice? Yeah, just, just briefly. Um, I think that the notion of kind of really um, sort of crit critiquing these generic Chinese cities, I would just like to, to make a comment on it. Um, I think this is a very complicated thing to look at a city and say, I don't know where that is, or, I've, or you know, it's a, very, um, it's a very generic site. Because um, actually, I mean, there's a, very, there's a very complicated relationship between the aspirations of the Chinese middle class, the success of these developments and the new cities and the urbanization of China from the rural to the cities. And actually, these, uh, these skyscrapers are aspirations, and they are what people want. And they're there because that's what people want. However, they're, of course, they're marketed, and therefore, it is a lot more complex. But um, yeah, I don't really agree with the kind of sweeping uh, disdain for those cities, because that's what, uh, that's what that's kind of represents very clearly what, what the kind of commercial globalization China is in at the moment. And in a way, it does feed into this idea about religion because um, the history of China is so, um, again, kind of riven that the, the, the idea of past and history and at looking at your past has ba basically been completely vetoed for the past 40 or 50 years. And actually only in the last 10 years um, have people even started to talk about heritage in China because it was so toxic. Um, and, and therefore, it is, it, is a complicated, it is a complicated topic. And um, where I used to live in, in China was in a hutong, um, in a very beautiful courtyard, um, where you know, it was probably the only enclave of, of history um, in that particular area. And everybody else was living in skyscrapers. Um, and in Shenzhen, uh, where I also used to live, the skyscraper that I was living in used to be a plot. It used to be a farm plot, because Shenzhen used to be um, um, a kind of fishing village. And the plot of land was um, given by the government as part of the um, renewal strategy for Shenzhen, um, the economic plan. And therefore, the farmers' plots were given to the farmers. The farmers, of course, built as high as they could physically build and rented out all the spaces. Therefore, the extrusion of these lands led to skyscrapers. And this has become, that's how people live in China since that time. Um, and those, of course, been built down because they, they, were, they, were, they were knocked down because they were so poorly built. Um, and didn't work out, and the villages and the cities were replaced by bigger and better ones. But um, yeah, it's just to say that this is a very, um, it's not, one can't really dismiss it in the same way that I think Emmanuel was talking about the favelas. I think there is a very similar relationship to that in China. Well, let me give you my take on the question of religion, particularly in the city. Um, my latest book is called The Fundamentalist City, Religiosity um, and the New Urbanism. And uh, in a sense, um, the argument in that book um, is that religion has made a tremendous comeback in the life of urbanism in the last decade or so of the 20th century and continues today. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt now with the rise of Islamist governments in much of the Arab world as a result of the Arab Spring that we are likely to see 
fundamental changes in the city. You work in the Gulf, so I'm sure you're aware of the role that religion plays in both decision making and in the public sphere. Um, and in, in fact, I would argue that we have not really seen much in terms of the impact of religion um, in some of the bigger cities of the Middle East, and we are likely to see more and more of that. Anybody that watched the events uh, that unfolded in Cairo and Tahrir Square over the 18 days and saw how Tahrir Square was turned into a big mosque accommodating half a million people three times during those 18 days uh, must actually absolutely marvel. Uh, at the rise of specific religious practices uh, and how they're likely to change the city. In fact, I think the issue of religion is likely to be the main issue of urbanism in the 21st century. Mike. Uh, I can, all I can do is wish Sean all the very best um, <laughs> because he should come first, not second. And one can hope that events like this, where that knowledge is being passed to a much wider audience, can get the understanding that not only is it good, it's risk-free, it pays, and in the long term, it creates a much better and healthier society. Um, as far as religion, well, I'm not sure which religion. For, for, for many, it's such a part of culture that it, it, it just is just there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there may be a religion of uh, uh, militant atheism, if, that, if you can call that a religion. What does that mean? Nothing at all. Uh, or it could be the religion of consumerism. Well, that we do see everywhere. Um, and so, yes, that, that clash between culture, which is based deeply and historically and, and, and what is replacing it to a large extent uh, with materialism, I, I think is an interesting area of debate. We can all see the results of it. Uh, I'm not sure whether somehow there's going to be a great revival of religion, at least in the West, in the way that will affect our cities. I don't know. Emmanuel, you get the last word. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would like to tell you that, um, well, it appears to be much easier for big names. You, you said famous architects are. Uh, and it is, of course, it is. It, uh, we still lose nine competition on 10. Well, it's, but it's easier, yes. Uh, well, I think that uh, the, 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 the problem is not only economic. Of course, the market leads everything. And when you discuss with many, many of big developers, who is going to have the last word is the marketing de uh, department. So it happens, hopefully, I hope, it, I think it will happen to you too, that you can meet some developers that think different. But it's, it's not only economic, it's also cultural. I think that it's much easier to reproduce something that we already know, not only because it's not risk, it's just easier because we are lazy. Everybody is lazy. It's much easier to copy and paste than to create and invent. And developers are not different than architects. Many architects are copying, pasting. Many developers are copying, pasting, doing the same they, they know how to do. That doesn't mean that doesn't exist some developers that will be interested by your vision. I hope it will happen. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, I am uh, asked before thanking our panel and all of you for attending to announce that the next session will actually start at 2.30 instead of 2 o'clock. I wanted to thank our panelists for this very interesting discussion and all of you for being here this afternoon. <laughs>